In 1988, the World Health Organization made a film based on a lecture by the obstetrician Professor Mahmoud Fatala. Its aim was to raise awareness of the millions of women and babies dying each year from pregnancy and childbirth. The film told the story of one such mother, Mrs. X. It was called, Why Did Mrs. X Die? Since then, there have been significant improvements in maternal health, yet by no means enough. In some places, things have hardly changed. Women and their babies are still dying needlessly. This is why the story of Mrs. X must be retold. This is the story of a mother called Mrs. X. Mrs. X could have come from anywhere, but she is most likely to have come from a low-income family in a poor country. Mrs. X represents a universal mother. Mrs. X died in a small hospital, eight months pregnant. The doctor had no doubt about the cause of her death a hemorrhage. Her placenta had been too low down in her uterus and hadn't been identified in time. The doctor recorded her death, closed her file, and added it to a growing stack of similar cases locked away in a cupboard. Over time, these stacks grew and grew. Some years later, worried about the high numbers of mothers dying in their hospital, the staff reviewed the cases to learn lessons and make improvements. They reopened and reviewed file after file. One of these was that of Mrs. X. When they read it, they found two striking points. First, Mrs. X had arrived at the hospital bleeding heavily, yet she only received half a litre of blood. This was all the hospital had available, and it was not enough. Second, Mrs. X and her baby needed a caesarean section, but resources were limited and the operation took place three hours too late. Both Mrs. X and her unborn baby died. The group then visited Mrs. X's village and spoke with her family, neighbors, and community leaders. They found that there were other reasons for her death. Mrs. X had a history of bleeding early in pregnancy but wasn't aware that this was a danger sign needing attention. She also had had only one antenatal visit. If she'd gone regularly, her problem may have been picked up. She would have been referred to a specialist, and she and her baby could have survived. Mrs. X was also severely anemic, so the loss of even the smallest amount of blood, as little as a cupful, could have tipped the balance between life and death. The team discovered that it had taken six hours to collect enough money to pay for her transport to the hospital. As a result of these findings, the hospital improved their blood supplies, updated their emergency procedures, and caesarean sections could now be performed as soon as was necessary. The local health department provided more midwives in more places to enable more women to have access to good maternity services throughout their pregnancy and birth. Mrs. X's file was closed again. A year later, a group of visiting health professionals came to the hospital as part of a national inquiry into maternal deaths. They wanted to understand what lay behind the statistics, beyond the numbers, and discover the wider social and economic reasons for the deaths of women like Mrs. X and their babies. And sound what check. Be done about it? One, two. Sound check. One, two. Uh, good afternoon, all, and welcome to this epoch making event. The event is about to start. Please. I will crave your intelligence to please arrange your sitting positions. Those of us that are behind should please find a place forward, just in front here, and fill the seats. 
just as we get ready to begin. Thank you and welcome. Distinguished Ruben, Bunny Mike. Ah, uh, please. The event is about to start. The senators are getting ready for the procession. I will want to plead with us, to all of us, while they are processing, be on our feet to welcome them. Once more, welcome to University of Jos, 106th inaugural lecture. Please, can we all be on our seats as the process is about to begin? The leader of the procession is the senior deputy registrar, Senate Affairs and Admission, Mr. Solomon Anjugu, who is ably here represented by Mr. Onyemachi Kelechi. An administrative officer one in the Senate Affairs and Admissions Division of the University of Jos. Thank you very much for.
So on the list, we have the Professor Vistipam, Dr. Swale Goshit, Dr. Lucy O. Ozela, Associate Professor Maga Efe, Dr. Bokop Wangwada. Gentlemen and ladies, once again, a round of applause to the senators who are arranging themselves. Welcome to this great day. <laughs> Professor Ayo Uja MNI. We also have in our midst the Vice Chancellor. Okay. The Vice Chancellor, Federal University of Medical Science, Otuko, which I earlier mentioned his name as Professor Ayo Uja MNI. Ladies and gentlemen, while at this juncture, without waste of time, I will want us to start this process proper. We are going to begin this session with the national anthem, after which the University of Joss anthem will follow. The next program on the agenda is the opening prayer. Ladies and gentlemen, at this moment of supplications, I will want to invite Venerable Justice Okoronko to lead us. Venerable sir, in the opening prayer. Venerable Justice Okoronko to open this gathering with a word of prayer. While he's on his way, at this moment, I would want to plead and call on Professor Pig Uoche to please help us with the opening supplications. Professor, sir. give you thanks Lord for who you are and what you do to us and for us and through us and thank you for the opportunity we have for another inaugural lecture 
we ask that by your spirit you will superintend over this granting wisdom and courage to the presenter and understanding to those of us who will listen at the end let everything be done to your glory we ask through Jesus Christ our Lord I might as well go ahead and take the opening remark please sit I have just done what someone else was supposed to have done, so I might as well just flow into the opening remarks that I should be taking. Um, I do want to say that it's a privilege to be here. I'm looking forward to listening to uh, Professor Amaka Ocheke that will be uh, teaching us today and bringing us insight into an area that she's very qualified to speak about. I would like to say that every professor owes is as a moral duty to present an inaugural lecture. Um, it is a sin, an academic sin for a, for a professor not to do so. So all those who have not done, you're owing me and please pay your debt. Amaka is paying her debt today. Uh, and I look forward to getting more of our professors doing this. Uh, I believe that it will be a rewarding time, and so I'd like to encourage you to listen, and please learn all you can. Good evening. Thank you very much, Prof, for your spirit-filled prayers and opening remark. Before we continue with the agenda, the next agenda, may I briefly introduce management staff of the University of Joss and other distinguished guests, invited guests that are here to grace this occasion. The management team of the University of Joss is ably led by the 10th Substantive Vice Chancellor of the University, Professor Tanko Isha, who is a fellow of the British Computer Society and a fellow, Nigerian Computer Society. He is here ably represented by the Deputy Vice Chancellor Administration, who is a senior advocate of Nigeria, Professor Juhash Amopitan. Also here is the first female registrar in the history of University of Joss and the first registrar to obtain a PhD certificate, Dr. Rejoice Songden. The bossa of the University of Joss, Mr. Philip Mbugala, is here represented by Mr. Aku. We also have in our midst Professor Teresa Madu, who is the Dean Faculty of Management Sciences among us. Also here with us is the Vice Chancellor, Federal University of Science, Health Science, Otuko, Professor Innocent Uja, MNI. Here with us also is the Chief Medical Director, University of Just Teaching Hospital, Dr. Pokop Wada. Other deans and directors here present, heads of units and divisions, directorates, distinguished guests, gentlemen of the press, students, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to this epoch-making event.
Uh, also here with us is Mrs. Regina Okafo, the mother, she's mother of the convener of this gathering here today. She's here with us to grace this table. She's She's here with her sister, Mrs. Ifei Adewumi. Also with her here is Ebu Augustine, Israel. He's her friend from University of Port Also here to grace this occasion is Reverend Salau from Equa Plateau Church. We also have in our midst Reverend Jerry Farouk. We also have in our midst members of Equa Plateau Church. Ladies and gentlemen, once more, a round of applause for Professor Amaka Ngozi Ochekwe, who has taken Ladies and gentlemen, on the agenda here, the next program is the address, welcome address by the Vice Chancellor of the University of Joss, Professor Tanko Ishaya, the Vice Chancellor, sir. Thank you very much, the Master of Ceremony. Let me start by quickly recognizing our brother and Vice Chancellor from Federal University of Health Sciences, Otupo, in person of Professor Innocent Uja. Please, Professor Innocent Uja, you have been part of us, and we want you to be on the high table. Please, can you come up? Can we give him a, a, a round of applause? Okay, thank you very much. Um, the registrar and other principal officers of the University of Joss that are present at this occasion the Provost of College of Health Sciences and Deans of Faculties, as well as Directors of the various centers, the Heads of Departments that are present, the Professors and Members of Senate, very distinguished invited guests for this occasion, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great pleasure on behalf of the Vice Chancellor, Professor Tanko Ishaya, who is on an important assignment in Lagos. When the whole idea of this inaugural came up, the Vice Chancellor's plan was to be here personally, but it has something to do with the international community, and therefore he could not delegate that responsibility. I therefore want to give the warm regards of the Vice Chancellor to every one of us, and most especially to 
the inaugural lecturer, Professor Amaka Ngozi Ocheke. I want to specially welcome you. And just as the coordinator, professor of the inaugural lecture, Professor Pico Wuchi said, um, it is an academic scene for a professor not to deliver an inaugural. I'm a lawyer. When you say something is a sin, it's more than a crime. So something that is bigger than a crime is a very serious matter. And so on this note, I want to congratulate our dear professor for this day. Today is your day. And I recall when I had occasion to stand before distinguished Senate members some years back, my own was 82nd inaugural lecture. And I said that that was a demonstration of my academic craftsmanship. So, and this is why we are gathered here today to witness the academic craftsmanship for so many years of Professor Amaka Ngozi Ocheke. Um, when I got the invitation the title, The Odyssey of Nigerian Uterus, Bombs, Potholes, and Accidents. I was thinking that uh, we have bombs, we have potholes, and you can have accidents only on the highway or on the road. And on the second thought, I said, maybe the professor will have a highway that is going to take all of us here. But I noticed that within the internal organ, reproductive organ, you could have a highway. So you have to listen ident attentively to her unraveling the bombs, the potholes, and the accidents that can occur in the uterus. Distinguished professors, ladies and gentlemen, I'm happy to tell you that when the University of Jos was established in 1978, it started as purely a teaching university. But over the years, we have gathered so much experience that we have now moved into a research university, not just teaching, but teaching and research. And so an inaugural is an opportunity for the lecturer to demonstrate her academic sagacity and contribution in terms of learning and research over the years. Um, I have seen some very technical words used in the lecture. I'm not going to go into the details, but I'm quite sure that this lecture will be intellectually nourishing for every one of us, so that at the end of the day, you will have no doubt as to the various bombs, potholes, and accidents that can lie within the organ that is being discussed. On behalf of the University of Joss, once again, I welcome you warmly, and uh, I will ask that you listen with rapt attention, listen attentively. And I also want to congratulate Professor Amaka Ngozi Ocheke for her contribution to academic development in the University of Jos. And uh, as we are delivering this inaugural lecture, I know that this is another chapter that you are opening your academic odyssey. And I pray that God will continue to guide you and be with you as you continue to give many more years of dedicated service to the University of Jos. Yesterday, a professor came to my office and said he was thinking of uh, retiring very soon. And I said, no, we have not tapped your brain enough. So I hope we still continue to benefit from the intellectual progress of Professor Amaka Ngozi Ocheke. And the university will continue to tap your brain. And God will continue to supply more wisdom, knowledge, and understanding in Jesus' name. 
So I welcome you all, and I pray that today's occasion will be remarkable and very successful. Thank you very much, and God bless you. Thank you very much, Vice Chancellor of the University of Joss, Professor Tanko Ishaya, FBCS, FNCS, for your warm address. The next item here on the program is the citation on the inaugural lecturer. But before that, permit me to introduce the lovely husband of all for whom we are all here together, Professor Isaac Ochekwe from the Department of Pediatrics. At this juncture, I will invite alongside Professor Ken Ozelu to come forward and give us a citation about the person or the lecturer to give us her inaugural lecture today. She, please, Professor Ochekwe is supposed to come out here while she's being cited by Professor Ozelu. Thank you, Prof. Thank you very much. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, principal officers of the university, distinguished guests, permit me to stand on already established protocol. Professor Amaka Ngozi Ocheke was born to Professor Raymond and Dr. Regina Okafo in Abidjan, Côte d'Ivoire. Her parents were both lecturers at the University of Port Harcourt, where she spent her early years. Professor Ocheke had her primary education at the University Demonstration Primary School in Port Harcourt, and from there she proceeded to the Federal Government Girls College, Abu Loma, Port Harcourt, where she obtained her senior secondary school certificate in 1986. She gained admission into the University of Port Harcourt to study medicine and graduated upon successfully completing the, her studies with B.Sc. Med Science in Physiology in 1990 and Bachelor of Medicine, Bachelor of Surgery in 1995. From 1996 to 97, Amaka did her pre-registration pre training as a house officer at the Joss University Teaching Hospital and subsequently proceeded to the General Hospital in Gombe for her youth service. Amaka, who has always striven for excellence in the pursuit of her medical career, elected to pursue a residency training program in obstetrics and gynecology. She therefore commenced her training in 2001 in Jude, and having passed the primary fellowship examinations earlier. She successfully completed her residency training in 2006 and is a fellow of both the West African College of Surgeons and the Medical College of Surgeons, Medical College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists of Nigeria. That's what we call a two-star general in medicine. Amaka was employed as lecturer one in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology, University of Joss in January, 2009, and also as an honorary consultant obstetrician gynecologist at the Joss University Teaching Hospital. She rose through the ranks and was appointed professor of obstetrics and gynecology in 2018. She has held the position of faculty student academic advisor, clinicals, and also head of department ONG from 2016 to 2020. She is currently the chairperson of the Student Support Committee of the Faculty of Clinical Sciences. Professor Maka has attended several trainings, including care and support for sexual assault survivors uh, in South Africa, understanding peer review literature um, organized by the New England Journal of Medicine in Boston, USA, health policy and financing course at Kit Royal Tropical Institute, Amsterdam, and simulation faculty development course at the University of Mbarara, uh, at the Mbarara University of Science and Technology in Uganda. 
Amaka has published well over 80 articles in journals, several of which are in high impact factor journals. She's well traveled, 80 ladies and gentlemen, 80. She has served as an external examiner for undergraduate programs in both um, Nigeria and the University of Gambia. She has supervised 35 dissertations. 35, this is no mean feat, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> dissertations that have been successfully defended for fellowship by her residents for both the West African College of Surgeons and the National Postgraduate Medical College of Nigeria. She's also a peer reviewer for several journals and is currently the editor-in-chief of the Highland Medical Research Journal. She's a member of various professional associations and organizations, including the NMA, Society of Gynecologists and Obstetricians of Nigeria, MD Khan, and the Nigerian Society of Endocrinology and Metabolism. Her selfless service to the community has endeared her to many and is a major contribution to national development. She has served at various times as volunteer counselor at the University of Just Youth Friendly Center, a volunteer for free community health projects at Poor Health International, and also a volunteer for community health education programs on reproductive health. Her humility, pleasant disposition, and quest for knowledge have made it easy for her to relate with people from all walks of life and to be admired and highly regarded by many. Amaka is a believer in Christ, who is very involved in the growth of her local church. She has served in various committees in her church, including band member, Sunday school teacher, marriage and family counselor, and coordinator of youth fellowships. She enjoys reading, watching movies, listening to gospel, music, and teaching. She's married to my chief, Professor Isaac Ocheke. Himself a professor of pediatrics at the University of Jaws, and they are blessed with four children. They say that what a man can do, a woman can do even better. Now, for a woman who has distinguished herself in a field that is largely concerned with the affairs of women, but paradoxically dominated by the male gender, what Amaka has achieved in this field is a feat not many males can surpass. There is therefore no one better qualified to guide us on this odyssey of the Nigerian uterus, including its bumps, potholes, and accidents. Mr. Vice Chancellor, sir, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I present to you a distinguished academic, scholar, a clinician for excellence, a professional, a mother, a wife, a teacher, a mentor, an Amazon, Professor Amaka Ngozi Ocheke. Professor. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. The Vice Chancellor, University of Jos. Professor Tanko Ishaya, ably represented by the Deputy Vice Chancellor, Academics, no, sorry, Administration, <laughs> Professor Ami Putan, the De De Deputy Vice Chancellor, Professor Rahila Gowan, the Deputy Vice Chancellor Admin, in his own right, Professor Ami Putan, the Registrar, Dr. Joyce, Rejoice Songden, the Bossa, Mr. Philip F. Mubugala, the University Librarian, Dr. Thomas A. Adigun, the Provost, College of Health Sciences, Deans and Directors, Heads of Departments, Members of Senate, Members of the University Community, Members of the University of Joss, University Teaching Hospital, Joss, Community Joss University Teaching Hospital, my Lord Spiritual and Temporal, Gentlemen of the Press, Distinguished Ladies and Gentlemen, it is my singular honor on this day 
and my privilege to stand before you to present the 106th inaugural lecture of the University of Jos. I will be talking about the Odyssey of the Nigerian Uterus, the bombs, the potholes, and the accidents. A few years ago, I had a patient. A young lady in her 20s, sickle cell, with sickle cell anemia, we know what sickle cell is, and everybody knows somebody or has been aware of somebody who has sickle cell disease and the problems associated with it. She also was carrying a set of twins. She also had preeclampsia, which is raised blood pressure, and um, is a condition that can get worse. Um, the lady can fit, it becomes eclampsia, and um, the baby and the mother could also lose their lives. And this was a serious condition for her, and life-threatening, as um, we can see. But after a few days on admission, she asked to be discharged. And I asked why. Her husband had had enough. He had decided that he was no more coming to see her and had asked his sister, who was her caregiver, to leave her in the hospital. Why? Because he felt she had connived with her doctors to continue to keep her on admission. But we know what the real story will be. No money. <laughs> so she had no support financial, physical, or emotional. A pregnant woman with sickle cell, carrying a set of twins, and with severe preeclampsia. This is the kind of condition that we find in our environment. And this is one of the reasons, you know, that drove me to want to uh, study obstetrics and gynecology, because I felt and I desired to help and better the lot of women in our country. I loved my posting in obstetrics and gynecology. It was my best post in obstetrics and pediatrics. I had great lecturers, I had great teachers, and I, had, I, I thoroughly enjoyed the posting. Um, I went for all the calls, I did all my clackings, I was available, I read my textbook. It's the only posting that I read my textbooks cover to cover, I did, for obstetrics and pediatrics. Unfortunately, the exam came round, I failed. <laughs> but it didn't discourage me. I retook the exam and passed and still made up my mind that this was the area that I would want to involve myself with. Anyway, I went on to specialize in the field and God granted my desire to be able to practice obstetrics and gynecology and also to teach. You know, I like to talk. So God granted my desire. I got the job at the University of Joss. I didn't get it just by my own strength. God raised help for me. The then Vice Chancellor, Professor Soniti Oden, the then Head of Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology, Professor P.H. Daru, late Mr. Patrick Kopara, and Mr. C. Egesie, we are very instrumental to me getting that job. And many others that I don't know, but I know that people were raised by God to help me. And that has been my story. I have always been helped by God and people. Hence, at this point, I would want to make a disclaimer. I am not a self-made woman. My career at the University of Joss, which involves teaching, research, and community service, has always been done with the help of God and the help and collaboration of others. I am a woman favored and helped by God and men in all my endeavors. Hence, a lot of things you would hear in this lecture were done in collaboration with others. Now back to my story about this woman. I'm sure you are wondering what happened to her. We told her we couldn't discharge her with a clear conscience. Or she could sign against medical advice and go, but whenever she could, we would see her if she came to, whenever she came to the hospital. She signed and left because to her, her marriage was very important. Unfortunately, we never saw her again, so I don't know how things turned out for her, but I hope things turned out well for her. So here is a glimpse of the problem of, that a woman can face during pregnancy and the possible problems she could um, encounter in our environment. 
Now, why do I want to talk about the uterus? Now, the French gynecologist, Etienne Tania, in discussing the treatment of a ruptured uterus, that's a, a uterus that has burst in the process of labor, has said, or said, if a woman in a battle to reproduce her race ruptures her uterus, she should be invalidated from service, for it is not with cripples that an army takes a field. What does that tell us? It highlights the importance of the uterus in the battle to propagate the human race. And this tells us that uterus is very, very important. Now, looking at the topic we have chosen, we find out that in life, many things reflect in other aspects of life, like bumps, accidents, and uh, potholes that we have talked about. And we'll look at this. Is this a common sight in our environment? Yes, everybody knows what bombs are. Rough roads that we find in our environment. And these rough roads can cause you discomfort while traveling. And they can be equated to minor challenges or obstacles faced by the uterus in her journey. Potholes. Somebody told me that this is not, that we don't just have potholes in Nigeria, that we have craters. But let's just manage potholes for here. Potholes also make the journey more uncomfortable and they also damage your car many times when you travel by road in nigeria when you come back you have to visit the mechanic am i right yes to fix your car so they also symbolize more serious challenges and obstacles that can result in adverse health outcomes and we all know what accidents are unexpected events and sometimes they can result in injury permanent disability and sometimes death and we know that accidents are a constant feature on our Nigerian roads, sometimes due to the bad state of the road and sometimes carelessness of drivers. So the Nigerian uterus, like a traveler on the Nigerian road, is affected by bombs, potholes, and accidents in her odyssey. An odyssey simply means a long and eventful or adventurous journey or experience. And the journey of the Nigerian uterus is very, very eventful. So does the uterus travel? Where does it travel to? How does it travel? And what are these events or adventures that it experiences? The answer to the first question is a resounding yes, which we'll look at. The uterus does travel. And the answer to the other three questions you will get in the course of the lecture. The uterus, also called a womb, is a secondary sex organ. That is, it is a component of the reproductive tract that matures during puberty under the influence of sex hormones produced from primary sex organs as the ovaries in the females and the primary sex organ is the testes in the males. It is a hollow pierce shaped muscular organ situated in the pelvis and lies between the bladder and the rectum behind it. These are the measurements and that is a picture of the uterus. And the uterus has four major regions, the fundus, the body, the isthmus and the cervix which we'll be talking about later. Now the journey of this uterus is a fundamental aspect of the female reproductive system which follows the life cycle or cycle of the woman that carries it. Stages of the journey as outlined um, here. Embryonic development up to the level of menopause. The functions of the uterus we, as we know is where you menstruate from. It's also a site for implantation when fertilization has occurred. It also provides protection and support for the fetus to grow in its development. And then when it is time, the uterus is also the organ that pushes out this, uter um, this uh, fetus from it to the outside world. We look also at the Nigerian environment. We see the population of our country, but I just want to highlight a few things. We have 52% urban dwellers, 40% live below the poverty line, and I hear it's getting worse, yes? is getting worse. More people are getting below the poverty line. Un unemployment rate is 33.3% and is also getting worse and is worse among young people. Our average life expectancy is 55.75 years. This is a very hostile environment in which to travel, as you must agree with me. Now we'll look at this odyssey of the Nigerian uterus. We'll look at different sections of the uterus, of the journey of this uterus, and some of the events that may occur in the different sections of the journey. 
I will also highlight some of the research that I have done in these areas in collaboration with other colleagues. And then you will decide if the uterus experiences bumps, potholes, and accidents during these events. Now, I've taken liberty to divide the journey, despite that it's, it can be broken down into many more parts, as I showed earlier, into three sections. We'll talk about the beginning of the journey. We'll talk about the journey itself, that's the, the uterus doing, carrying out its functions, and the twilight and the end of the journey of the uterus in life. Now, at the beginning of the journey, we look at the embryonic development of the uterus. It begins its development during intrauterine life in another uterus. Very interesting. And many congenital uterine anomalies can affect some or all the uterine functions, precluding a successful pregnancy in the future. So sometimes, based on what happens while the uterus is in another uterus developing, the uterus may be absent, hence the menstruation will never occur. And then some of these other anomal abnormalities that develop may not show any sign until much later when you now want to get the lady needs to get pregnant and you may begin to have adverse reproductive outcomes. These are some pictures of the uterus, abnormal uterus. You see the normal one and then the abnormal ones. Our experience at the Just University Teaching Hospital has been that many of these conditions present much later in life with amenorrhea, that's inability to menstruate, infertility, inability to get pregnant, recurrent pregnancy losses, and sometimes even uterine rupture. And the other challenge is that diagnosis and treatment can be a challenge for many patients due to cost. Now we look at adolescence. Adolescent pregnancy, at this time, the uterus should be preparing for its function. Most times, um, uh, not most times, but a number of times, adolescents get pregnant too early. And many times this pregnancy is unintended and a number of them will end in induced abortions, which many times are unsafe. Some of them also result from coerced sex, rape. And then we also found out that risky sexual behavior, as we found in our study in some of the higher institutions on the plateau, may also contribute to unwanted pregnancy. These pregnancies in adolescents face higher risk of complications and deaths as a result of pregnancy as compared to older women. And our studies in youth have shown that 5% of the women who deliver in the labor world are adolescents. And one of the major causes of adolescents from pregnancy, from death in adolescents from pregnancy, is unsafe abortions, eclampsia, which we'll look at later, and sepsis infection. This is um, the number of um, adolescents or teenagers who died in pregnancy. Now look at unsafe abortions. In Nigeria, adolescents account for up to 74% of induced abortions, which is approximately 60% of our gynecological hospital admissions. Adolescents are more seriously affected by these complications compared to older women. And some of these complications would include tears in the cervix, that's the mouth of the womb, perforated uterus or bowel, bleeding, chronic pelvic infection, abscesses, long-term infertility, um, endotoxic shock, renal failure, and also death. And then they could also have ectopic pregnancies, chronic pelvic pain, and infertility, as I mentioned earlier. 23% of the surgeries that are done among pediatric patients, young patients in youth, we found were for septic abortion. And this is our figure. Now, we also want to visit the issue of rape. We had said earlier that a significant proportion of adolescent pregnancies are a result of rape. Not only adolescents are raped, but they, they seem to be more common amongst them. The uh, Nigerian National Demographic Health, um, National Health and Demographic Survey of 2018 reports that 9% of Nigerian women have experienced sexual violence, and less than 50% of them ever have sought help to, to solve the problem. That shows it's a serious problem amongst us. And our studies have shown that 5.6% of patients who come to a gynecological emergency unit are for rape, and 64% of these are aged less than 16 years. And these are some of the complications that could arise from rape, you can see. And we also conducted a study in four major health facilities um, on the plateau. The major, one of the major things we found out was that there was no written protocol for management of rape, and then many of the places didn't have any private examination room designated 
in the use of caring for rape survivors because they need privacy. They've already been traumatized. And if you don't give them privacy, you traumatize them again. Many centers also do not have counselors, psychologists, and social workers dedicated to the care of these patients. Now we'll look at the reproductive period. We'll first look at the issues of having a uterus. Some problems just occur because you just have a uterus. The first one we'll look at will be uterine fibroid, also we call leomyoma. It's a benign tumor of the uterus, and 30% of women of reproductive age have fibroids of different sizes. Many are asymptomatic, but um, the etiology of the cause is not known, but it has been associated with hormonal factors, genetic factors, and others as stated um, on the slide. There's also um, evidence for genetic predisposition, and it's more common in black women. One of the major symptoms of um, uterine fibroids, when they have symptoms, because many are sympt asymptomatic, is heavy menstrual loss. And also, they could affect pregnancy when pregnancy occurs. I experience with uterine fibroids is that women will usually come with large fibroids. And they will prefer to have myomectomies than to have hysterectomies. That's, they prefer you just removing the fibroid than removing the womb, because many people want to die with their womb and be buried with their womb. Yes. <laughs> and then we found out that um, surgeries for removal of the womb, hysterectomies, the most common reason why we would remove benign reason is for uterine fibroids. So some women would agree, but many would not. Now look at this picture. This is a uterine fibroid that we removed. The woman came, the fibroid was so big. You can see how big it is. By the time we weighed it, that fibroid was three kilograms. That's the weight of a newborn baby. And that shows you that many of our women wait late before coming for um, surgeries because of many myths and stories associated around fibroid. That's the fibroid before, that's the fibroid or the uterus after the surgery. Then we look at adenomyosis. It presents like fibroids. Um, the patients are usually black, multiparous as they've had babies before and they are diagnosed late in their late 30s or early 40s. It can cause severe dysmenorrhea, that's menstrual pain and increased menstrual loss. You can see a picture of it. The lining, what happens there is that the lining of the womb, which is the endometrium, you find similar tissue in the muscle of the endometrium, of the, of the uterus, sorry. Now, um, we found that um, among many women that undergo in vitro fertilization, and um, yes, IVF as we know it, there is as women who have adenomyosis, there's associated reduced risk of getting pregnant and live birth, as well as increased risk of uh, miscarriages. Now look at the challenges um, in using the uterus. Uterine function, when the uterus is functioning, what are some of these challenges as the uterus journeys and does its function? Um, infertility, that's one of the challenges which we all know. Inability of a couple to achieve pregnancy despite regular unprotected intercourse for one year. It affects 20 to 30% in Nigeria as opposed to like 15% or less in other countries. And this is due to high rate of sexually transmitted diseases, complications of unsafe abortion, and problems or infections following delivery. 30% of infertility may be due to female problems, another 30 male problems, another 30, both of them, while 10% we have, we find no reason that we can identify. Now, these are some of the causes. Uh, male factor, tubal factor, peritoneal factor, and the treatment for infertility entails treating the underlying cause. When that cannot be done, we also do artificial reproductive techniques, which include ovulation induction and in vitro fertilization that many of you are familiar with. We have IVF services at the Joss University Teaching Hospital as a result of collaboration between the University of Joss and the Joss University Teaching Hospital. Collaboration works. So our experience among um, our, our patients with infertility is that 50% of our outpatient um, consultation is for infertility. is a problem around us. And many times by the time we see them in the clinic, they have usually visited several hospitals, traditional medicine practitioners, and faith healers. And then many of them are also lost to follow up. We start treatment, but they don't stay. After a while, we don't see them again. Now we want to look at polycystic ovarian syndrome, PCOS. 
it is one of the causes of infertility due to ovulation. And the diagnosis is made with the presence of oligomenorrhea, that is reduced menstruation, and or an ovulation when you are not ovulating, clinical or biochemical signs of hyperandrogenism, and polycystic ovaries on ultrasound scan, and you have to exclude other etiologies. Now, the, our problem with polycystic ovarian syndrome is not just that it causes infertility, but it is also associated with increased risk of glucose intolerance, diabetes mellitus, uh, dyslipidemia, systemic inflammation, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, hypertension, and coagulation disorders. That's a lot for one disease. And then it's also associated with increased risk for endometrial cancer, osteoarthritis, obstructive sleep apnea, depression and anxiety, and increased risk of hypertensive disorders during pregnancy. So even if people are not looking for pregnancy with PCOS, it has to be taken care of and they need to be followed up long term. Oh, what have I done? Okay. Okay, I experience with patients with PCOS as with patients with infertility. Many will lose to follow up. They don't come and they delay in doing investigation, sometimes for financial reasons. And our studies with PCOS have shown that infertility is the main reason why they present at all. If they didn't have infertility, many of them would not come. And then we also did a study at the University of Joss among the female students, undergraduates, and we found out that 1.53% of them had PCOS with menstrual abnormalities. Now we look at early pregnancy loss. Spontaneous miscarriage, as we know it, or spontaneous abortion, that we call it, is a pregnancy that ends spontaneously before the fetus has reached a viable gestational age, which is 28 weeks in Nigeria. Many factors contribute to early pregnancy losses. Chromosomal abnormalities, advanced maternal age, medical endocrine disorders, uterine abnormalities, infections, smoking, alcohol ingestion, drugs, and chemicals. And so we encourage that people who have this problem should seek help. Our studies on women with recurrent pregnancy losses reveal that they have a high prevalence of cytomegalovirus and rubella, which are common causes of um, pregnancy losses in, in early gestational ages. But they didn't seem to be associated with recurrent miscarriages among our own women. Then we look at molar pregnancy. Molar pregnancy presents like uh, a miscarriage, but it's the history of management of this and the other associated um, diseases, which we call gestational trophoblastic diseases, can be considered as one of the success stories of modern medicine. They are all treatable if patients present early. Now, um, they present with absence menstru absent menstruation, that's amenorrhea, vaginal bleeding, spontaneous passage of grape-like vesicles, and um, they can also cause severe vomiting in pregnancy, what we call hyperemesis gravidarum, Doe uterus, inappropriate uterine size, tecaluteal cyst, and rarely they could also cause thyrotoxicosis, that problem of the thyroid gland, and preeclampsia. Our research also shows that it is common in JOS, uh, presents commonly with vaginal bleeding, and 10% of them become cancerous. Our study showed that none of our patients completed the recommended uh, duration of follow-up. They should be followed up for one year, but many do not, all of them didn't, um, complete the one-year follow-up period, and only a quarter of them had histology reports to confirm diagnosis, usually financial constraints. Now look at uterine us usage, and look at the antenatal period. That's when women are pregnant, that part of the journey. When they are pregnant, we look at the, some of the challenges and events that occur. Preeclampsia, we had mentioned earlier, is a hypertensive disorder of pregnancy, and is a leading cause of maternal and neonatal deaths particularly in our environment. It occurs after the 20th week of pregnancy, is characterized by hypertension and the presence of protein, significant protein in the urine. And when convulsion occurs, it is called eclampsia. And we found out that it accounts for 69.4% of um, obstetric admissions to the intensive care unit of Josh University Teaching Hospital and contributes significantly to maternal deaths and newborn deaths, as we mentioned earlier. We look at multiple gestation. People like twins, right? People like to have many babies, especially when you dress them with uniform and everybody, oh, oh, oh so nice and all that. But there are problems with them. <laughs> multiple pregnancy or multiple gestation is when there's more than one baby. 
and um, it has become more common with the use of ovulation induction drugs and assisted reproduction techniques. Twin pregnancy is the commonest of multiple pregnancies and occurs more in blacks. And interestingly, we have the highest rate in the world among the Yorubas. Multiple gestation is associated with increased complications for both mother and babies, which is directly proportional to the number of babies that you have. So if you uh, attend a wedding where they are praying for twins, triplets, watch the gynecologist very well. They don't follow to say amen. Yes, because we know what the problems associated with twins, triplets, quadruplets are. And um, we, we don't... We, <laughs> We manage them, we take care of them, but it's not something that we will look forward to. They are, they are a problem. So our research at the George University Teaching Hospital on triplets revealed that they are associated, as we already know, with increased maternal and fetal complications, but those who received antenatal care had better fetal outcomes. Now look at medical conditions. We had mentioned earlier about the patient with sickle cell anemia. We all know what sickle cell anemia is. It worsens maternal and fetal outcomes. And our study in Jude also revealed that many of them book late for antenatal care. And these are the people who need antenatal care more. And they have high maternal and perinatal mortality and morbidity, as we had mentioned earlier. Also anemia, just anemia, low blood level. It's also a problem in developing countries. And it's such a serious problem that even WHO has reduced the standard um, to define anemia in our environment, or is it yes, reduced? Because anemia cutoff mark it should be 11 grams per deal, but among our pregnant women here and in other developing countries, we use 10. That means it's a very serious problem and prevalent in our environment. It is affected by malaria, undernutrition, high parity, that's having many children, and HIV AIDS. And our studies have released, revealed that, or revealed that we had a low prevalence of hookworm infestation among our pregnant women. Hookworm is one of the causes of anemia, but our women seem to have lower uh, levels of hookworm infestation, which is good. But the more you have hookworm infestations, the more the incidence of anemia. And then we found anemia to be also be more prevalent among HIV-positive women. Diabetes mellitus is another medical condition we see in pregnancy. We know what diabetes is. Everybody has heard about diabetes. Now, one of the problems with diabetes, as we had also mentioned earlier, mother and babies are adversely affected by this. One of the problems also is that babies also have increased incidence of congenital abnormalities. So we advise that women should have their sugar levels well controlled before they embark on a pregnancy. And when they embark on pregnancy, they should book early for antenatal care. Our studies have shown that um, there's those with increased weight, more than 90 kilograms and above, is associated with increased risk of insulin resistance and higher glucose levels. Now, um, we also look at infections and infestations. Malaria, malaria is common in our environment. And it is worse in pregnant women because they are carrying a baby and they also have a placenta. So the risk is more, the effects are more. And um, our studies in Jude reveal that the prevalence of malaria parasitemia in pregnancy is still high in spite of available things to reduce malaria infestation in these women, including things like mosquito uh, insecticide treated nets and um, the use of um, fancida early in pregnancy. HIV, having your first pregnancy and those with anemia, we are more likely to have parasitemia. Now look at HIV. We know that women in developing countries have higher risk of having HIV because of biological, social, and cultural factors. And 90% of infections you have in children uh, from HIV results from mother-to-child transmission. That's why we need to protect um, these babies when their mothers are pregnant. And our studies on HIV has revealed that the uptake of HIV cancelling and testing is relatively high, especially among the women, female population in our environment. And then there's a declining trend in maternal HIV infection at our delivery settings in JOS, which is good news. We also look at hepatitis B virus infection. It is also a determinant for vertical transmission that's from mother to baby. Um, and hepatitis B infection 
among pregnant women we found is high in JOS, especially among those without prior vaccination and those who have HIV and those who have many more children. Let's also remember that hepatitis B is also responsible for cancer of the liver. Now look at chorioamnonitis, an acute inflammation of the membranes and chorion of the placenta in response to microbial invasion or other pathological processes. Some of the risk factors, prolonged labor, prolonged rupture of membranes, prematurity, post socioeconomic level. And our studies have found that histological chorioamnonitis is higher among HIV positive patients, but we found no adverse maternal and fetal outcomes, probably because most of our patients are, are on highly active antiretroviral drugs. We also look at syphilis. Syphilis is a problem in Africa and in Southeast Asia. It also causes adverse birth outcomes in the children. They have congenital abnormalities, they die early, they have low birth weight and congenital syphilis and, and uh, disabilities. Our study showed that only 27.6% of women who registered for antenatal care got tested for syphilis and 1.1% only, and 1 .1 of them tested positive. People should be testing. Now look at antipartum hemorrhage. That's bleeding before labor. Two conditions account most commonly for this. Placenta previa, which is a condition where the placenta is situated wholly or partially in the lower uterine segment. We we'll see pictures soon after. And then abruptual placenta, which is the premature separation of a normally situated placenta and causes life-threatening complications and death of baby and mother. Obstetric hemorrhage remains one of the major causes of maternal death in developing countries. So we can see the picture. The first one is a normal placenta. The second one, you can see bleeding behind the placenta. That's a placenta abruptio. And then the, the last one, you can see placenta previa, where the placenta is coming before the baby. Placenta should come after the baby. Now we'll look at labor and delivery. Um, we we'll look at obstructed labor. Labor is said to be obstructed when there is failure of progress of labor despite adequate uterine contractions due to mechanical factors. And if it is unrelieved, it will lead to various maternal and fetal complications. Now, um, they associated, this is associated with many complications like uterine rupture, postpartum hemorrhage, preparal sepsis, bladder injury, vesicovaginal fistula, which we are all familiar with, and poor fetal outcomes like birth asphyxia, stillbirths, and sepsis. Unfortunately, still a huge problem in Nigeria. Accounts for a proportion of maternal deaths. And um, one of the problems or the challenges with this is that it's something that we can easily prevent by using a pathograph. Just a simple um, graphic representation of the events of labor. If used appropriately, we easily pick up obstructed labor in patients and they will be attended to or referred to centers where they can be attended to. And our studies among community health workers who work in primary health centers revealed that their theoretical and practical knowledge about the pathograph and its use is very poor. This is the pathograph. You can see it's very easy and easy to use <laughs> for us who are obstetricians and health workers. We also look at the ruptured uterus, the spontaneous tearing of the uterus, which may result in the baby being expelled into the peritoneal cavity. It is rare in developed countries where there's accessible, affordable, and efficient and effective maternal health care services. Unfortunately here, it accounts for 12.1% of maternal near misses and 8.7% of maternal deaths. And um, risk factors for ruptured uterus are obstructed labor, scarred uterus, uterine manipulations, injudicious use of oxytocin. Oxytocin is a very good drug, but people use it anyhow, and it causes trouble for us. And then congenital uterine anomalies of which we have published a case report on earlier. Now, postpartum, after delivery, problems that occur. Postpartum hemorrhage, bleeding after delivery. Um, primary postpartum hemorrhage is defined as blood loss from the genital tract within the first 24 hours following vaginal delivery of more than 500 mils or more than one liter after caesarean section or enough to change the hemodynamic status of the mother. It is a leading cause of maternal deaths in our environment and significantly contributes to the burden of maternal mobility and mortality in our environment. 
And from our studies in Nigeria, it shows that it accounts for 10.5% of maternal deaths. And some of the factors that contribute to poor outcome from postpartum hemorrhage is lack of skilled birth attendants, poor quality drugs, poorly equipped hospitals, especially lack of blood transfusion services and operating capabilities. Some hospitals do not have operating theaters or people to work in the operating theaters. Then we we'll look at postpartum depression. Depression is a psychiatric problem, but it occurs following delivery. And it is more prevalent in developing countries. Many times the diagnosis is delayed and it causes, it has its complications. And risk factors for postpartum um, depression would include lack of social, especially spousal support, prior history of depression and other emotional problems, obstetric and infant problems, stressful life events, and Nigeria is stressful right now. Unemployment, unwanted pregnancies, the age of the mother, the younger the mother, the more the problems. Birth of a child with a non-preferred sex. So when you want a baby boy and you get a baby girl, you know what? And then increased stressors in the environment, lack of food, inadequate income and housing conditions, which are all happening in Nigeria right now. So we expect that postpartum depression is going to get worse. And our studies induced on postpartum depression showed that 44% of our women had postpartum depression. It was more in new mothers who had low birth weight babies, and um, these were people who were more at risk of developing postpartum depression. Now we'll stop briefly to look at the aids we have available to improve uterine function. Antenatal care. This antenatal care um, provides care for women who are pregnant during pregnancy through a series of consultations with trained health care workers. It enhances early identification and management of conditions that could be threatening to the mother and her unborn baby. It screens for infections, prepares the woman to deliver, the women receive um, education about uh, health behaviors, what to expect in pregnancy, pregnancy danger signs, and they also get information on family planning. And we found out that women who use antenatal services are more likely to deliver in the hospital and have skilled delivery. Unfortunately, the picture in Nigeria is that our women are still not using antenatal care the way they should. We expect that over 90% of women should be using antenatal care or should receive antenatal care, but we have only 67%. It has increased over the years, but we are not yet there. And uh, from the NHDS of 2018, the overall antenatal care coverage, as I said earlier, is 67%. And non-usage of antenatal care is commonest among women who are poor, those who live in rural areas, and then those who are less educated. Facility delivery, skilled birth attendants. Women who use this will have better outcomes in pregnancy. But we find out that only 39% of women in Nigeria deliver their last life birth in a health facility, which is just a 4% increase in the last 10 years. Of these women, 26% delivered in a public facility, 13 in a private facility, while 59% of our women delivered at home. 43% of deliveries were attended or assisted by a skilled birth attendant. And factors associated with home delivery and um, use or non-use of skilled birth attendants, it depends on the mother's level of education, her wealth, that's her economic empowerment, her parity, the number of children she has had, whether she received antenatal care, whether she lives in an urban or rural area, and the geopolitical zone of residence, worse in the north. Now look at cesarean section. We know about cesarean section. And many of our women are averse to cesarean section. One of the responses we receive when we ask women to sign to have a cesarean section is, it's not my portion. I reject it. I want to deliver like the Hebrew women, whatever that means. And unfortunately, cesarean section rates are still very low in this country, 3%. And the WHO recommendation should be about 10 to 15% if we are going to get good maternal and fetal outcomes. Poor availability, accessibility to healthcare, sometimes it's available but people cannot pay for it and they reject it. A high proportion of our women, as I mentioned earlier, have been found to be adverse to caesarean section and sometimes over 10% would not accept caesarean section under any circumstances, even if it kills them. And our study in JOS found out that women well, are beginning to accept caesarean section more, but we are not yet there. 
Um, but we still have a strong aversion for the procedure. And the reasons that the women gave was fear of the operation, lack of finance, and the fear of being stigmatized. You know, when you say real women are women who deliver by themselves. The one who has cesarean section, I don't know whether they have become men. <laughs> okay, when we also look at family planning, it's a strong aid to help the uterus to perform its function. It helps couples and individuals realize their basic right to decide freely and responsibly if and when to have children, and as well as how many children to have. Our women are still not using family planning, and we have one of the highest fertility rates in the world. Our total demand for family planning among currently married women is just 36%, and that's not good enough. And reasons people have given for not using family planning, lack of education, desire for more children, uncertainty about its need, partner disapproval, your husband doesn't want you to do family planning, previous side effects, religious um, beliefs, cultural disapproval, the age of the woman, wealth index, and on and on and on. And um, one of the problems with, you find with family planning um, from our study is that people have the desire for it, but when they think about having more children and the stories they hear about what family planning may do to them, they decide um, not to um, take on the family planning services that we have available. Then we will stop here at this point to examine severe maternal outcomes. Because when we look at severe maternal outcomes, it will show us a true picture of these bombs that we're talking about, these potholes that we're talking about, and the accidents that occur, and affect all the other things about um, this journey of the uterus. But it is more glaring when we look at severe maternal outcomes, which include maternal mortality and maternal nearness. Margaret Chan, who is the former um, DG of WHO, says that maternal mortality rate is a very sensitive indicator. All you need to look at is a country's maternal mortality rate. It is a surrogate for whether the country's health system is working. If it works for women, I'm sure it will work for men. So maternal mortality is the death of a woman while pregnant or within 42 days of termination of pregnancy from any cause related to or aggravated by the pregnancy or its management, but not from accidental or incidental causes. While maternal near miss is the near death of a woman from a complication during pregnancy, childbirth, or within 42 days after the termination of the pregnancy. We took time to analyze and distill the works of maternal mortality that we had done in Joss and in Nigeria. And um, some of these bumps and potholes and accidents are apparent. When we looked at the statistics, you can see that our maternal mortality ratio is very high. Um, it is said that 20% of all global maternal deaths happen in Nigeria, where Nigeria only accounts for 2% of the world's population. A woman in Nigeria has 1 in 22 lifetime risk of dying during pregnancy and childbirth, whereas in developed countries, the lifetime risk is 1 in 4,900. You can hear the difference. Now, we also looked at the causes. The most common causes of uh, severe maternal outcomes, obstetric causes, were hemorrhage, preeclampsia, eclampsia, and infections. Non obstetric causes were severe anemia, cancer, hepatic diseases, and HIV AIDS. You can see that these conditions can be prevented from happening, or they can be treated early to avoid complications with proper care, which include, as we mentioned earlier, antenatal care, skilled attendance in labor family planning to space pregnancies or prevent unwanted pregnancies. We also looked at the social demographics of women who had severe maternal outcomes. Women's extremes of age, the very young, the very old, those with no formal education and those who did not attend antenatal care or receive antenatal care. 50% of these women were admitted in critical condition with close to half of them arriving at night. About a third of these women who died presented late to the hospital. A quarter of them lacked health insurance or were unable to pay for the required services. Those who lived greater than five kilometers from the health facility were more likely to die. Avoidable factors contributing to these maternal deaths were delay in the woman seeking health care. When you live far away, you don't have money, you are poor, you will delay. Delay in appropriate referrals, 
and lack or delay of transport from home to health facilities. And we also found out in our study among community health workers that the practice of referral of obstetric patients among them was very poor. People keep patients until patients are very bad before they refer. Then we also looked at healthcare related issues. The median time between diagnosis and critical intervention was 60 minutes, but in a fifth of these cases, it was over four hours. The higher the cadre of staff that attended to the patients, the better the outcome. Deficiencies in clinical management of close to half of these women with severe maternal outcomes um, were more common among those who died. And these deficiencies that we found, or substandard care, was due to late presentation to the hospital, lack of health insurance, or inability to pay for the services, non-availability of required blood and blood products. One third of the women who delivered in publicly funded facilities died while 0.2% of women who delivered in privately funded facilities died. It's looking like it's better to deliver in a private facility than in a public facility. Is that not so? So we now look at child survival. Child survival is not a function of the uterus. However, it affects the functions of the uterus. We can see from the data on the, uh, on the board that the indices for children is very poor and so bad that greater than one in eight children in Nigeria will die before they, their fifth birthday. The more children die, the more women will have babies to replace the dead, the dead ones. And the more these babies will die. A vicious circle that needs to be broken. And our research in this area um, showed that antipartum hypoxia and acute intrapartum events were the leading causes of perinatal deaths. We also showed uh, that methylated spirits and chlorhexidine gel were good for cleaning the umbilicus to prevent neonatal sepsis, and then the umbilical stump, sorry. And then we developed a nomogram for head circumference reference values, which could be more appropriate in defining normal head growth in Nigerian infant population, thereby improving newborn care. Now we we'll go back to our journey. We we'll look at menopause till death. Menopause is the permanent cessation of menstruation due to failure of ovarian function. The uterus is no longer working because the ovaries have ceased to function. The most common symptom we find in our country is hot flushes among our women, which is the same um, issue across the world. What I experienced here is that few of our women seek medical help for complaints, for such complaints. People say it's when you have finished eating and are satisfied before you start talking about hot flushes, right? And we found out that um, HIV, cigarette smoking, quality of life, and stage of menopause transition also was associated with severe menopause symptoms among our women. We look at utero-vaginal prolapse. That's the descent of the uterus and cervix into or through the vagina through, uh, due to weakness of the pelvic supporting structures. This is um, a picture of stages of uterine prolapse. Now, the common characteristics of patients who have UV prolapse in our environment, they usually present an average of three years after the onset of symptoms. They don't come early. They are elderly, postmenopausal, of high parity, five to nine children. Low educational level, they have received no antenatal care during their pregnancies, no skilled attendant in deliveries, and no contraceptive use during their reproductive years. We look at malignant conditions. Malignant conditions can occur at any time during the journey of the uterus, from childhood to adulthood, but it occurs more in older women. And gynecological cancers from our study accounted for 5.4% of the gynecological disease burden. Now look at endometrial cancer. It's common in developed countries. It's the third commonest gynecological cancer in our findings in youth and in our environment here. Risk factors, obesity, diabetes, not having any children, late menopause, unopposed estrogen therapy, and the rest as we see on the board. The most common symptom of endometrial cancer is abnormal vaginal bleeding. And we see a picture of endometrial cancer. The cancer, we see it inside the uterus. Some patients may also present with fistula, bony metastasis. And from my experience, like most other cancers, our patients present late and many of them cannot afford the treatment associated with um, caring for these patients. Now look at cervical cancer. 
90% of deaths of cervical cancer occur in low and middle income countries. It is a common cancer in our environment associated with human papilloma virus, low socioeconomic status, smoking, marrying before the age of 18 years, young age at first sexual intercourse, multiple sexual partners, multiple sexual partners of spouse, multiple childbirths and immunosuppression like HIV. This is the uterus and we can see the cancer at the mouth of the uterus. That is the cervix. That's what we, is the simple way we describe it to our women. The most pre uh, common presenting symptom of cervical cancer is abnormal vaginal bleeding. Postcoital uh, bleeding, that's bleeding after sexual intercourse or postmenopausal bleeding. Women who have stopped menstruating suddenly start bleeding. In developed countries, the, pro the picture is vastly different from what we have here because uh, cervical cancer there is uncommon because of screening, education, and access to good medical care, which includes vaccines. In Nigeria, there is no national human papilloma virus vaccination schedule. The knowledge about cervical cancer screening and uptake is very poor. Only 8.7% of all Nigerian women aged 18 years or more have ever been screened for cervical cancer. And that we can see from the chart there. Then we also conducted a survey of non-communicable diseases among employees of University of Joss a few years back. And the females were offered cervical screening. Of the 362 women recruited for the study, only 58% of them presented themselves from the, for the screening. We did it for like three weeks running. Those who did not come for the screening, we contacted them by phone to find out why they didn't come. You need just women. And the reasons ranged from not being aware of the importance, not interested, they were busy, or they were afraid of diagnosis of cancer. So avoiding diagnosis will solve the problem, right? So our other studies on cervical cancer revealed that those with HIV, a past history of sexually transmitted infection, and usage of combined oral contraceptive pills had a higher risk for development of pre-malignant cervical lesions. Now, why does this our uterus in Nigeria undergo such challenges during its journey? It's obvious to us. Social issues are our problems. Social issues are our problems. The problems the Nigerian uterus has is not different from what other uterus have in other countries. But social conditions give us bad outcomes. And these are what we call social determinants of health. Social economic status, the poorer you are, the worse the outcome. Gender inequality, education, the less educated you are, the poorer your outcomes. Cultural and religious beliefs direct our access to health care, our desire to take family planning services, and other things. Access to reproductive health services. Some people want to access the services, but it's not available to them or it's not affordable to them. Social stigma and discrimination. If you go for family planning services, people may look at you one kind. If you decide to take, do cesarean or have a cesarean section, they will, they will stigmatize you. You are not a proper woman and things like that. And then legal and policy framework. What policies do we have available for our women and the rest of the population in seeking health care? The way forward. What do we do? I'll briefly tell us about Autobahn. I've never been to Germany before, but those who have been say that the Autobahn is a very fantastic development in that country. Or, and it, is, it was made to provide for unimpeded high-speed traffic flow. That's what it was made for. What we call nylon tar, when you see the road. They say when the car, when you drive a car on an Autobahn, the car realizes what it was created for. There are no potholes. <laughs> there are no bombs. And accidents barely occur. Because there are things put in place to make sure that accidents do not occur. The roads are so good that we are told that many car companies go to test the speed of their cars on autobahns. And the, the way the, the, there's an inspection team that inspects autobahns from time to time, regularly. And if any portion is found to have any crack, they don't just patch it. They remove that section of the road and replace it. That is how good the autobahn is. So, we need an autobahn for our Nigerian uterus. <laughs> but do, how do we build that kind of road where there will be no bombs, no potholes, and no accidents? So, what can we do? 
First of all, we start with public enlightenment. The public, including our gatekeepers, need to be properly enlightened about the issues that we have raised. We need to give accurate information and what, um, what people need to know. In line with this, for those of us who came early, you saw the film that we put up on maternal mortality. Ways to inform people about what is going on. Also, at the end of this uh, um, event, we also will put up a drama here for just a short time. So we crave your indulgence to just wait behind. We are using different methods to do public enlightenment. And that drama is one of the methods that we are looking at to inform and enlighten the public on issues that concern what we have been talking about. So please wait briefly behind to watch this and then give us feedback at the end of the day. Mass literacy campaign, education, especially that of the girl child. Education improves health knowledge and awareness, health literacy, positive behavior change, empowers individuals to take control of their health and advocate for their own well-being. It encourages them to make informed choices, communicate with health care providers, and actively participate in health care decision-making process. Female empowerment. Women who are empowered have better health-seeking behavior and can fund health care. And female empowerment includes education that we have mentioned earlier, employment, high socioeconomic status, and having a voice in decision making. The issues we have raised earlier, like contraceptive use, antenatal care, delivery ac uh, uh, assistance, and others, are all positively associated with women empowerment. The um, National Demographic Health Survey of 2018 revealed that 74 percent of our married women were gainfully employed, as opposed to 99% of the men. 72% of them with cash earnings reported that they themselves made decisions about how their earnings are used. Only 34% of them participated in three specific household decisions regarding their own health, household purchases, and visits to their family or relatives. Only 22% of Nigerian women have a bank account that they use, and 55% own mobile phones more needs to be done. Our healthcare system, we have doctors, we have healthcare workers that are knowledgeable, hardworking, and not faced by challenges that they are faced with. However, they need to have things work properly and be properly motivated. That is why everybody now is doing what? Japan. Yes, everybody is going. And so we need to revisit and upgrade and invest in our healthcare system from the primary to the tertiary level so that this, these uh, facilities are available, affordable, and accessible to the populace. We also need to retrain and retrain medical personnel. They need to be up to date in their knowledge, in their field. So we need to continue training. And one of the things I've been involved in recently is simulation-based learning, which is a very valuable platform that we use to bridge gap, the gap between theoretical knowledge and clinical practice ultimately preparing learners to provide safe, effective, and compassionate patient care. This is used in the aviation industry, and we are now beginning to use it here in our faculty. And we have commenced and, um, and college, and we hope that it becomes entrenched, entrenched in our training curricula. Research also must be taken seriously. Government needs to, we need to invest in research, and not just doing research for research sake, Transition, uh, translational research, what is useful to us, what is happening in our environment. This, for example, free maternal care, is it really free? These governors that have put um, free maternal care services in their states, is it really working? Is the governor getting feedback? Because I worked in Gombe, and I know when I worked there as a, a copper, healthcare was free. So we had so many patients. When you go for a ward round, you have, in a ward, you can have 40 beds, then you have floor one, floor two, floor three, floor four, up to 40, then you have corridor one, corridor two, corridor three, corridor four, patients. And yet, practically everything the patient needs, they have to buy. So the only thing that is free is, yes. So we need to, to reset, is this working, and give feedback back to the people who make these, um, these policies. Also, we need to look at health insurance. Many people, from, from what you have heard during our presentation, cannot pay for their hospital bills. Many people pay out of hospital expenses. And our study on health insurance among, health, among uh, women 
attending antenatal care. Only 6.9% of our women had health, uh, had national health care insurance scheme coverage. And this was more glaring among women who were less than 30 years, those who had no education and first-time pregnancies. We need to also work on other social amenities, roads, electricity, then governance. Governance. All the things we have been talking about rest on governance. Governance has a huge role to play in achieving all that we have mentioned earlier. The government is responsible to us. They are not doing us a favor. They are responsible to us. So I need to, to us to raise a few issues from Chapter 2, Section 14 of the 1999 Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria as amended. Sovereignty belongs to the people of Nigeria from whom government through this constitution derives all its powers and authority. Who owns the power? It's us now. Good. The security and welfare of the people shall be the primary purpose of the government. Is it what is happening? Mm -hmm. The participation by the people in their government shall be ensured in, in accordance with the provision of this constitution. Are you participating? Okay. Also, section 17, subsection 3, subsection D, states that the state shall direct its policy towards ensuring that there are adequate medical and health facilities for all persons. Section 18, subsection 3, states that the government shall strive to eradicate illiteracy. And to this end, government shall ask and when practicable, it is practicable, provide free compulsory and universal primary education, free university education, free adult literacy program. Okay. Also, our fundamental rights are stated in chapter 4 of our constitution. We need to read this constitution. So we must understand government's responsibility to us and our own responsibility by voting wisely and holding our leaders accountable. Good governance is not a privilege, but it is our right. So we must be properly informed and exercise our civic duty. So I will, in, I will ple plead with each one of us as we arise from here, go and buy a copy of the Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Read it, digest it, and when you want to choose leaders, meditate on those things and you will choose appropriately. In conclusion, the odyssey of the Nigerian uterus is also the story of the journey of the Nigerian woman and the goal to improve her lot in this nation. Professor Fatala, a past president of the International Federation of Obstetricians and Gynecologists said, women are not suffering and dying because of untreatable diseases. They are dying because societies have yet to make the decision that their lives are worth saving. We have not yet valued women's lives and health highly enough, and that of the rest of the population. This and the ability to ensure safe travels for the Nigerian uterus seems to be largely dependent on good governance and all that it entails. Hence, we need to choose our leaders carefully, hold them accountable to create a Nigeria where, in the words of Aisha Yusuf, a child of nobody, can become somebody without knowing anybody. And in the light of our lecture, a Nigeria where every uterus can go through its life journey with no bombs, potholes, or accidents. Thank you for listening. Thank you. So permit me at this point to make my acknowledgments. I need to do this because I know that for many, for many, including myself, I don't know, this may be my only opportunity in my lifetime to publicly acknowledge some people and I need to do it. In the lyrics of Mercy Chinwo's song, Chine Doom, it says, You make the little things I do be like saying a big thing. 
Your grace makes a difference. Just they embarrass me. This is the summary of the work of God in my life. And I'm grateful to the Almighty God who has made it so. I'm grateful to my parents. My father, late Professor Rebo Nunda Dozil Kafo. And my mother, Dr. Mrs. Regina Ndidio Kafo. Who raised me and created an enabling environment for me to live, to thrive, to allow me to dream and believe I could be anything I wanted to be with no limitations. I never knew there was a limitation to the girl child until I left my parents' house. I'm also grateful to my uncles and aunties who co-parented me with my parents, my uncle Cody, Eugene, Victor, my aunties Pat, Flora, Vero, Nonye, and their spouses. To my sister, my only sister, Ifunanya, and her husband, Sheyi, and their children, Simi and Duro, thank you for all the love and support. You have been there through the journey. And also, all my numerous cousins, I come from a large extended family. Dalono, thank you. To my in-laws, who have welcomed me with open arms and love, Anya Wune Wune, thank you, thank you. I'm grateful to my teachers over the years who have impacted me greatly. My primary school teacher, Mr. Oswagu and Mrs. Onukafo, who taught me in primary four and five. I don't, I don't forget them. They had confidence in me. They prodded me and pushed me on. They believed in me and pushed me on to excel. My secondary school teachers, especially my late principal, Mrs. A.K. Agu, Mr. Ibe, Mrs. A.G.K. my chemistry teacher, Mrs. Nen Nangokolo, our math teacher, who went beyond the line of duty to make sure that we excelled. They finished the syllables. They went to A-level syllables to help us write jam. They tried. They did well. My university lecturers, plenty of them, but especially Professor Sinkangineme, Ihekweba, I worked in their units, Kesley Harrison, C.T. John, late N.D. Briggs, and Anthony Okpani, and Professor Khalil. They were my favorite teachers, and they made learning very easy and interesting. And my present lecturers in the Faculty of Law, I'm doing a Master's in Law and Diplomacy. That's why I'm, <laughs> that's why I'm spewing out the Nigerian Constitution. They are teaching me, and my eyes are opening. I'm becoming learned, so watch out. <laughs> I also want to thank some fathers. Professor Ongu Diegu, Giwa Osage, Professor Wakwe, Ali Meka, Professor Chris Isichie, Kenneth Kachi, there are these people that whenever I know I'm going to meet them, I go with trepidation because I have to give explanation of how far and how well I'm going in my career journey. They have prodded me on. And Professor Selina Okolo, she can worry. And she worries you in the right direction. Professor Edith Okeke, Professor Teresa Madu, Professor Irene Agunloye, thank you very much for pushing and stressing me to move in this career. My brother in Christ, Uncle Nats Madu, he said I shouldn't mention him, but I must mention you, Uncle. Thank you for what you have done, what you are doing, and what you continue to do to me and my family. Late Uncle Steve Chia, thank you. Give Sinonime, also known as Uncle Popcorn by my children. He's always coming with popcorn. Thank you for all you have done. God sees and he will reward accordingly. I thank my colleagues during my residency program. Chinonye Yusebu Sezugu, Alex Meangwa, Tinu Oyebode, Osayande Osage, Rob Samohai. You helped make it bearable. You helped make it, you helped make it bearable and survivable. It was tough, but we made it. I want to thank my colleagues in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology, many who are seated here and seated in front. All of them, I'll mention you one by name, each by name. Professors Uja, Sage, Mutir, Imade, Kashima, Icy Palm, Ekwempu, Daru, Musa, Visi Palm, Nyango, Shambe, Oyebode, Ebodo, Kehansim, Anyaka, Ali, Goshit. You have given me an enabling environment to thrive. As, we, as the person read my citation, he said it was a male dominated environment. And I know that many women complain when they work with men that they make life difficult for them. But these men have been different. These men have been different. And I want to thank them. Thank you, thank you, thank you. 
They have become fathers. They have become brothers. And I'm proud to call many of them friends. I also want to thank my colleagues from the Highland Medical Research Journal. Our simulation team, SIM team, you see our picture with Professor Yiltok, our leader. The University of Just Youth Friendly Center and the Student Support Committee of the Faculty of Clinical Sciences, University of Joss. Thank you very much. I thank and appreciate our provost, uh, my deans, HODs, including my current HOD, Professor Shambe, colleagues and staff of the College of Health Sciences, and also those of the Joss University Teaching Hospital. You can see my CMDs here. You help make the work lighter. A special shout out to Professor Yil Talk. Thank you. Thank you for how you have supported us when you were provost and continue to do, even now that you have left office. And it looks like you are grooming Mpiet. He's walking in your steps. Thank you. God bless you. Professors Agaba and Agaba, husband and wife professor. Collins, John. Professor Piwuna, Ozoilo, Obindo. Thank you for your stress. You stress me, but you keep me on my toes. And I truly appreciate, appreciate your support. Thank you very much for all you do. Professor Sismaila, Adoga, Ma'an, Anna Gyang, and Amusa. Thank you. The way I disturb you, I bring patients to your clinic, I interrupt your clinic, I stress your life. You accept me smiling, you accept my patients smiling. Thank you. God bless you. My residents and students for making teaching and training easy for me. Thank you. Thank you. It's been a privilege working with you all. Then I especially want to appreciate Ephraim Samuel, Doctors Ephraim Samuel, Samuel Onu, Otobo Uja, Clement Ekere, Clement Ayuba, Felix, Felix Elachi, Grace Makan, Robert Bobby Akpa, Kainde, Hassan Saadu, and Henry Eze, who have been my men Friday at different times. I send them, I ask them to do this and that, and they do for me without complaining. Thank you so much. My support system, yes. My beloved church, Equa Plateau Church, you guys rock, you are the best. You have loved, supported, and cheered me on over the years, thank you. I especially want to also appreciate my Bible study zone, Miango Bible study zone. Thank you for all your sacrifice. And the church band, where I go to get my weekly high. As they say, if you know, you know. My schoolmates from the University of Port Harcourt, especially the U86 set, the journey started tough, but thank God we are getting all right. Especially grateful to late Dr. Jerry Nkwacha, who was a rallying point for us. Jerry, you are missed. My sisters from FGGC Abloma, Abloma Girls, especially my 86 set, as we used to sing, Abloma Girls, Now We the Rain. Medical Women Association of Nigeria, Plateau State Chapter, a great support group giving insights on how to cope in difficult terrains. Thank you, thank you, thank you. My friends, Kalista Uche Mose, Aleru Chichike, or Oleru now, sorry. Ebu, Augustine, she's here with me. Clara, Betha, Neka Sule, Elizabeth Dauda, Hanatu Wazo, Chioma Kenao Ofodile, Nike Madubiko and their spouses, and so many other friends, but these ones I want to mention specially. Thank you for all you do for me and for bearing with me. No, no, they manage me so. My children, David, Ehilotana, Joshua, Ojun, thank you. Thank you for your support and making it not too difficult to parent you. Though you stress me sometimes, but thank you. And my husband. As we say in Igbo, Dima Oma, my good husband. I lack the appropriate words, but I thank you for the love, support, encouragement, Obuolohi. Enabling environment and not holding me back, but rather pushing me to soar. My husband has given me space to fly. Please thank him for me. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I don't have money. I don't have naira, I don't have dollars, I don't have pounds, but I have people. That's my greatest asset. I am rich because of people, I'm wealthy because of people. 
People have supported me throughout my life. And more and more are supporting. I have not appreciated all, but you know yourselves and the role you have played in my life. The Ajas, thank you. I thank you for all the time you have taken and the time you have taken to even come for this lecture. Taking time for your busy schedule in these difficult times to grace the occasion. Thank you, thank you, thank you. May the Lord bless each and every one of you. A round of applause, please. Thank you, thank you, and thank you. Please, we can do more than this. You can do more than this. You can do more than this. Thank you very much, Professor Ocheke, for your wonderful lecture. At this moment is a moment of presentation of gifts by the Vice Chancellor to the inaugural lecturer. May I once more invite the Vice Chancellor, University of Joss, to present gifts to the inaugural lecturer. Please, the immediate family should join the inaugural lecturer, Professor Ocheke, especially the husband, the mother, the children, and close relations, please. Thank you so very much, our dear, very, very distinguished professor, for that very scintillating progress, intellectual progress, and sagacity in which you have put into your career over the years. Let me say that University of Jos is very grateful to you for all that you have contributed to your area of specialization and to the medical profession. Um, just as you have explained, a lot of people have inspired you and they have touched your lives. And I noticed that uh, some of them are here present and they are our colleagues. Um, you wish you had dollars, you had money, you had pounds sterling and euro to give all of us. Because I'm also one of them, because you mentioned the Faculty of Law and the, the university administration. In the same vein, you know what the university system is going through in Nigeria presently. And I wish we have money, dollars, pounds sterling, euro to deliver to you. But let me tell you, something more than money is here, which is going to this very erudite scholar and professor of obstetrics and gynecology. Before I present this gift, when they say it's a gift, I thought actually I was going to present a brand new car to her. Um, but I wish our inaugural could get to that stage, whereby after the inaugural, you just have a holiday trip to uh, wherever you want to go. I'm sure that we'll get to that stage. But Prof, let me tell you, the university management had opportunity, occasion to visit one of the most prominent religious leaders in this country uh, who happened to be an alumnus of University of Jos. Uh, talking of um, Dr. Paul Eneche and his wife. And we asked him to pray for us as a university management. He said, I will pray for you. But before I pray for you, I have longed all my life to have the university to come and pray for me because there's a blessing God has put in the hand of university administration. He said, release your blessing first to me before I release my own. And uh, he was so elated that 
the vice chancellor will come and bless him. So I am there for blessing you on behalf of the vice chancellor of University of Joss because it's very, very spiritual that because of your services, year of services, you will remain blessed and you will move from height to height. You will move from grace to grace. So um, this is much more than what we have to give. If my vice chancellor were around, he will warn. Please, this is not money. So don't go and ask her, where is my own share, my own portion. No. This is just a token appreciation from the management of the university. In fact, on behalf of the staff, the student that you have taught, you have mentored over the years, as well as every member of the university community, we will remain grateful to you. Today you have been celebrated. You are going to be celebrated once again, very soon. Uh, before I present the gift, between the professor and uh, the husband and the inaugural lecturer, who is the successful person? Both of them. Both of them. OK, thank you very much. Um, let me also reiterate the point that the successful person were your parents, because they were, so, they were able to produce somebody like you. You therefore have the responsibility to bring up your children and also ensure that they are greater than you. You have achieved so much. On behalf of the Senate of the University of Joss, I want to present to you, uh, in the presence of your family, your dear husband, our colleague and professor, and your children, this uh, very precious gift from the university. And uh, I hope that it will be uh, a precious one that you continue to cherish today, being the day that you have put a very big burden of your neck and you have presented your academic craftsmanship. Congratulations. Congratulations. And to our prof, congratulations. I, I have warned you this is properly wrapped. It's not dollars. You can see it's not having the shape of dollars or euro. So on behalf of the university also, I want to present this to you uh, in recognition of your academic prowess. As a matter of fact, it's as if you should not end the lecture, but it has to end. So thank you so very much. God bless you and continue to keep you and your family. You know, when you said for gynecologists, when they are praying for twins and triplets, they will not say amen. Others will say amen. And for us lawyers too, when you are praying that what will implicate you and get you to the court and the police, may you not see it. Other people will say amen, but the lawyers will not say amen. Thank you so very much. God bless all of you. Uh, you can also have a handshake with the vice chancellor. Today I'm here wearing the hat of the vice chancellor, like Pastor Eneche said, the vice chancellor should bless all of you, and you are blessed. Thank you so much. God bless you all. Thank you very much, the vice chancellor, for the presentation of gifts. The next item on the program here is vote of thanks to be carried out by Professor Caleb Piet, the acting provost, College of Health Sciences of the University of Jos. Provost, sir.
to God be the glory for this great day. On behalf of the Provost Professor Caleb Impiet, I stand here to thank all of us for this time. We've stayed here, some of us came earlier than three o'clock. I'll start by giving thanks to Almighty God for making it possible for Professor Ocheke uh, Amaka to give this inaugural lecture. I know last week we were talking about it with her, and I know how difficult it is for all mothers to prepare to sit down and prepare something like this. Knowing that every woman is a mother, a wife, a homemaker or a home organizer. So for her to sit down and prepare this lecture, we know it's all the grace of God. I want to thank the Vice Chancellor, who is ably represented by the DVC, Professor Amipiton, for sitting all through the lecture and being with us here. Thank you very much, sir. I also want to thank his counterpart, Professor Uja, each time there is a lecture by the gynecologist, Professor Uja is always here all the way from Otupo. We thank you very much, sir. You are welcome. I want to thank the boss, sir, who is ably represented by Mr. Oku. Thank you, sir, for being with us, too. Thank you very much, our dear friend, the registrar, Rejoice Sunday. Thanks for sitting all through. I know being a woman, this lecture is also very interesting to you as well. Um, I would like to thank the deans, the directors, heads of departments, professors, lecturers, and all others who have made it lively and are here with us. I know the CMD was nodding his head because most of the research were done in youth. And I know he's very happy to hear that all of us are working hard in Jude. Thank you so much, CMD. I know you have a lot to do in Jude, but you've taken your time to be with us here. Thank you very much. I want to thank Mama, Mama Amaka. Thank you very much, Ma. <laughs> thank you for leading the delegation to be here. And, thank, and we also thank your grandchildren for surrounding you and keeping you to this time. I will especially thank Professor Isaac Ocheke. Beside, not behind, every successful woman is also a man. Thank you for the encouragement. I want to thank our colleagues, the doctors from Jude, the resident doctors, and especially our students who have been making this place very lively. Thank you for coming and for sharing. You are not just your teacher, but also your mommy and your mentor. Thank you very much. I want to thank the press, the protocol, and every other person that has found time to be with us here. Thank you very much, and God bless you all. Thank you very much, Professor Caleb Piet, for your vote of thanks. Here represented uh, by Professor Wadi, Patricia Wadi. Uh, this moment on the agenda now is the closing prayer. And I will at this time invite Reverend Peter Salau for the closing supplication. Reverend Sir. Shall we pray together? Father God, we cannot agree less with the psalmist when he says, I am wonderfully and fearfully made. Lord, we are all wonderfully and fearfully made. 
Thank you for giving some people the wisdom to study human body and how to handle every situation that comes to us. Lord, we thank you for people like Professor Amaka Ocheke and all others who have given inaugural lectures at different points in this institution. Thank you for many who still persist, even under this difficult situation to serve their fatherland. Thank you for the students who are learning, who are also going to go out someday and become what you want them to become. Lord, we thank you for this occasion that we placed before you at, uh, before we started. We thank you for leading us through. We are about to depart now. Lord, we want to pray particularly for the governments of our nation. Lord, they have a responsibility. And most of them are shying away from this responsibility. That is why many important people, brains, have left the shore of this land to go and look for green pastures. Lord, we pray that our governments will do that which is right in the name of Jesus. That they will fund all these institutions, Lord, to the point that this nation will enjoy good health in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, we pray that particularly those who are called by your name, you call them the light and you also call them the, the salt. Father, we pray that everyone will shine in their little corners to the glory and honor of your name. For the lecturer today, Father, we pray that we preserve her. Preserve her life. Preserve all the lecturers and preserve their families. As we depart, Lord, we commit ourselves unto you. Lord, we pray that your grace will cover every one of us. The situation in the country is tense. Lord, you are the only one that can help us out. For our leaders, Lord, may they hear your voice and may they listen to you. And may they do that which is right in your sight. Thank you, Heavenly Father, again as we depart. We pray that we go with every one of us. We ask all this in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you very much for the closing supplication. Please, may we remain standing for the Unijos Anthem and National Anthem, please. Unijos Anthem.
Our lecture. The audience, please, should wait behind. The, the procession is going to be in reverse order, starting with the vice chancellor, other principal officers, and following. Please, we are all to wait. Please, we are to wait behind for the short play because you will understand the lecturer better if having wait for the play. The short play is very, very important. It will give us a perfect and clear understanding on the lecture. Please, we are to wait behind. Thank you and God bless. Once more, welcome. 